Timothy. We'll be in chapter two tonight. We'll talk just, might just touch on a couple things in one, but as we move into two. Um, I've got some things that have been, uh, I've been just informed of that uh, you need to know because everyone needs to be soliciting. Uh, I mean, everyone needs to be praying for these that I'm going to mention, but, uh, and that'll be part of what we talk about tonight in chapter two of 1 Timothy about prayers. But uh, first of all, let me say that Kevin Pilling has been going through an awful lot the last, I'd say six months, three months, and he's just recently got out of the hospital. He's here tonight, which is a great thing. But he wanted to make sure that I personally thank each of you for all the time you've spent praying for him. And uh, he has recovered and doing well. And just all the good things that this congregation, this family of God's people has done for him. But uh, he wanted me to say that. But uh, you can express, but continue to pray for Kevin. He's had some other minor surgery. And uh, wanted you to also be updated on Harold Collins. He has had to go back to the hospital again. Uh, started out with a with a blood pressure drop. I guess that's the right word. Became very unstable, and they got him to uh, the hospital again, Advent, and so he's going to continue to. Uh, uh, I guess the right word is be tested to find out if, if they can figure out what's going on. Um, he's going to be going through some things, so I'm, I'm sure he'll be there a couple of days for sure. Many of you probably have already taken a look at, uh, uh, might have seen it on Facebook where Barbara is asking for prayers for her son, Rains uh, Jackson, Rains Jackson. He is uh, the son that comes and, vi- matter of fact, he was here Sunday, comes and visits his family. He is he lives in Japan, but he is here because of medical reasons, and uh, just be praying for them. He's going to have to be going through some uh, more testing, and uh, then they will determine what will take place from there. And then uh, you all know, and we've mentioned many times, and you have done a wonderful thing in reaching out to the family for uh, Linda Norton and her situation of continuing to have... Uh, uh, they've had to call hospice in, as we made mention on, on Sunday. There is, uh, the doctors had turned her so-called, I'm just going to use the term, they have said there's nothing else we can do for you and uh, no other medicines or whatever. We're still waiting on a response from uh, the doctors that are looking into Gary Earhart's situation also. Uh, he has been tested. And t- or whatever they going through, and he has not gotten another word on that yet. And we're waiting to hear that, as I know many of you are. And then after uh, just, uh, just great news that thrilled all of us with Carl Champ being in remission and uh, feeling like it was on the good side of things, he had another PET scan and it has come back with uh, another spot somewhere else. So um, that's uh, gonna be kind of tough, but uh, he just said to me tonight, the PET scan was not good. So he's gonna have to uh, be under doctor's care again and or whatever takes place, but uh, he wanted y'all to know, but more than anything, he's asking for our prayers. You know, he is not one to be very needy other than he, he, he really asked, he just really wants us to be praying for him, that things will turn out good. And then I was talking to Christine Gerald not too long ago, uh, and she just, in telling me some other things, she was trying to, uh, uh, it wasn't even on her mind, but her, one of her brothers now, his, her oldest brother, has passed away. So Christine needs to be in our prayers as we think about that. So, I mean, that's not, uh, not great things to be sharing with you, especially, but uh, a lot of prayers needed. The great thing is Kevin is on the mend, so 
and that's that's wonderful news. So we need to be thankful for that. So um, anybody want to have anything to say about First Timothy, the first chapter? other than we know what it's all about and who's, who, who the characters are and where we're moving forward from. Anybody, anything you want to share? Okay, as you know, it, we're talking uh, about an epistle written to Timothy, and we're in the second chapter, and he is the young preacher that Paul is leaving. I'm just going to use the word behind to stay in Ephesus and to get some things accomplished for God, in God's word. So I hope you have an outline. We'll be following that tonight. I'll try to do a much better job than I did uh, last week of, uh, of staying on top of the outline as it's been presented to you. So uh, thinking about the outline and looking at it, we have a summary of what, and we're going to go straight to the summary of it here in a minute, but I'd like for you, if you have your Bible, because I read two or three different translations, the NIT, uh, the New Century, and then I use the New King James that I'm going to read tonight. So whatever translation you're using, some of the wording is a little bit different and some of it can give a little, little different insight to some things, but I hope when we discuss it and we talk about it tonight, we'll be able to get all that lined up where we have a good understanding. But more than anything, uh, the apostle has written to him, and I'm going to begin reading there in verse 1 of chapter 2. I will read the whole chapter, so if you have your Bible, follow along. Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all those who are in authority, and the reason he gives is that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly clothing, but that which is proper for women possess, uh, professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing and that they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Got a lot of interesting uh, things that uh, he tells Timothy. I think most interesting of all is something that I think anywhere you might go and anytime you might uh, see someone and talking about this, uh, you know, he reminds Timothy there in our summary a little bit to remain in Ephesus and he is going to be fighting the good warfare as it's called. And that of course is preaching the gospel and he's gone over the importance of that in chapter one and we've just established it again that God doesn't want any to perish and now he begins telling Timothy in matters that involve the church. So this is what I want you to think about when we go into chapter 2. He is talking about inside the church. That's what he is getting ready to share. He's talking, going to talk to men about prayer. And he's going to talk to women about submission and how to learn. And he's talking about inside the church, in the worship. That is what he is referring to. And uh, he's going to talk about whom and why we should pray 
and what his desire is, and then we'll talk a little bit about the different posture of praying. And I know that here it's got the, the words, lifting holy hands, and we'll talk briefly about that or talk as long as you want to about it, but it will be something that we will touch on. And then the rest of the summary, just as when men were, as men were to pray everywhere, so the same thing, he turns, the, he talks about what the men are to do and he jumps right over to what the women are to do. And he goes ahead and says they're not to, they're to adorn themselves properly. Uh, of course, that's modest apparel worn with propriety and moderation, but it also includes, you'll notice at the end of that, good works are part of that. And, uh, you know, he goes on and, uh, he goes on and says it's proper for when women that are per, professing godliness. I want to stop right there with that term godliness and just tell you that word appears at least in my Bible and you might have a different translation. Paul addresses and uses the term godliness seven different times in the book of 1 Timothy. So it is one of those things that he is headlining, putting a light on godliness and of course that is that is a characteristic that he is talking to Timothy about telling them about godliness is important so that is something that we need to keep in mind a woman is not permitted to teach or have authority over a man basing this restriction on the relationship of Adam and Eve and the fall Paul reminds us and we will go to that in a few minutes and they can be saved in their natural role of childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So looking at the first part about prayer, I thought it was interesting that he uses four different words that kind of mean the same thing. They is telling us as he begins there, if you will notice that uh, in your Bible, in uh, chapter 2, verse 1, He's exhorting them, I want you to be aware of what you must do. He doesn't just use the word prayer. He uses different words for different things. He says, but they all mean about the same thing. He's asking that you use supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority. So let's talk just briefly your ideas about those four things. Anybody want to just give me an idea of when you hear, I know that we understand intercessory prayer. We understand what prayer is, but uh, I hope that we would see that, uh, you know, that uh, all of those things are, are, are important that we do for anyone in authority, but notice what it says, for all men. I think Jesus did a great job of teaching us about loving our enemy. You know, when we have enemies, we're not only to love them, we right here, Timothy's saying, uh, in Timothy, excuse me, Paul is telling him, we need to pray for all men, regardless of their standing before us. So with that in mind, someone tell me what are uh, supplications that we make or whatever your Bible might say. Tell me how, what a supplication might be. Anyone? Anybody have an idea of what we're talking about when we make supplications to God? Okay, exactly. And I think we all were asking for something and of course depending on our situation of what we're asking for. But then what is a prayer actually? We're actually approaching God and that's, that's what we always think of. But I think we sometimes leave off that all of these things in a sense are to be offered to God, a supplication, okay? What is an intercessory prayer? What is an intercession? Anyone? Didn't we, sir? Okay, so exactly, we are going to, and he's, he's telling them, listen, when you go to that church, you need to make sure they understand 
supplication, you understand prayer, but also they need to intercede for others that might not be praying to God, that might be sick, that we're going to pray for in a few minutes before we leave here tonight. You know, that's, that's an intercessory prayer. We're asking God to look down on those people that I mentioned. And that's what we'll do. We'll ask God to look down on them. You know, and uh, it's something that is very important that uh, needed to be established in Ephesus. Kind of get the indication that the Apostle Paul had been to enough places and Ephesus probably, I'm not going to say it is totally different, but probably pretty much just like everybody else, everywhere he had been and everywhere he had planted the church, probably knew pretty much that they were maybe not doing a very good job of doing those things for all men. Maybe they were doing it for just their loved ones, but he's saying here it needs to be done for all men. And of course, we understand the giving of thanks. And I think we do that on a great, I mean, I think we do a good job of thanking God for the things uh, that we have, that we possess, the blessings that he has given us, I think are very important. And of course, it has to be important because uh, God is having the Holy Spirit direct Paul to write this to Timothy to tell him, listen, do this first of all, teach the men to pray. Tell them how important prayer is. And that's exactly right. And it needs to be that way and going forward. Um, Any any thoughts on any of those three that I just mentioned, or four things that I just mentioned? So tell me that um, as we go in, excuse me, I'm not supposed to say tell me, sorry. Take a look at chapter, uh, sorry about that. Verse two. Look at verse 2. We're supposed to be doing this for kings and all those who are in authority. Now, I'm just going to let you know, he doesn't want anybody left out of that. And of course, you and I don't live under a king or queen, you know, uh, and I, I guess she would have been in authority, would have been appropriate, anybody in authority we need to be praying for. And there's a reason behind that. And the reason we're praying for them is the very next verse there in verse three, uh, the fact, excuse me, the second part of two, that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life, you know, in godliness and having God things that are important. And I'll tell you, if we're not spending the time to pray for them, you know, sometimes we only pray and when we're in dire straits about things or something bad has happened in our country. But you know, our obligation, regardless of where, I'm just going to use our political separation of Democrat or Republican, we need to be praying for our leaders. I always pray for great judgment on behalf of all so that all can be taken care of, you know, instead of just a specific group or a specific way of thinking because When he went in there, listen, there was no difference than where we live now, I don't believe. I mean, there was a little bit of, you know, Roman rule and those things going on. So it was a little bit of a challenge. But uh, as you think about that, uh, just be aware of that. Notice what it goes on to say in verse 3 that we have already read. And it's in your outline that uh, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. The fact that we're doing that in that way for all men and for these leaders and for others is a good thing. And God approves of that. And that's got to be very important to us trying as Christians to do what needs to be done. Verse 4 is the key element, I think, as we move into it because of what we talked about in 1 Timothy is the fact that God wants all to be saved. You know, sometimes we lose sight of that. Sometimes we lose sight of uh, the Russian aggressor is on my mind tonight because of the way he's treating those people in another country. But my obligation as a Christian is to be praying for all men, praying that he'd gain, 
I guess my prayer would be that he gained some sense and praying that he would turn to the word of God rather than the hostile environment he's used to living in. That's all I, you know, but it's, it's sometimes a tough thing as an American when we've had so many choices, but we're challenged by that sometimes. But I want you to know the word of God, the challenge was right there in front of Timothy when he was reading this and went into Ephesus. It was the same kind of thing. They were having some hard dealings in that town. And these Christians, I'm sure, were having a, having a hard time. But uh, he wanted all men to be saved. Um, take a look with me at uh, verse 5. For there is one God. Who does that eliminate? Who does one God eliminate? Anybody else? But I want you to think with me about the amount of people that are on this side of the aisle away from God that believe there is another God somewhere. And they fight, kill, murder, and will not put up with anybody that is not on their side of the ledger. And it's unbelievable that it is so plain. He is telling us, and Paul had the uh, Holy Spirit inspire him to write down to this young man, you need to tell him there's one God, one God, and now he's getting ready to tell him another thing, one mediator. There is not some other uh, something that you've invented, some other way of getting it done, but this is what's got to take place. And I was just, you know, I, I read two or three things about this one God. There is one God, you know, and it goes on, it goes on to say that, and that is not too hard for us to understand as we read our language that there is one God who desires all men to be saved. And I just thought, boy, that does that eliminate a lot of people. And that's just unfortunate. Because God wants them all to be saved. He wants to give them the same blessings we have. But they kind of eliminate their self. But that's why he needs to take place. So let's talk about a mediator. Anybody ever used one before? Mediator? Anybody ever had a mediator involved in their life? I know I have. I've had to have a mediator before. And it was interesting. All they were was an intercessory, a person that went on my behalf to another. Anybody else have a better definition of what a mediator is? You know, or have thought about what a mediator is? But he went in there and he was going in there as an intermediary to reconcile the difference between the two. That's all it was. That's what a mediator does. Uh, really, if we wanted to shorten that up, a mediator, Jesus Christ, he's saying, is a go-between. That's what Christ is, is the mediator, the go-between us and God. We are not capable the way we live to address God. So we have a mediator that will do it. He will go between and get that accomplished. And I think Paul, uh, I'm not going to keep saying how wonderful, Paul is just right on time with this. There's one God, there's one mediator. So all these other things, do you, anybody want to remember uh, what we talked about last week? They were starting to believe, what were they? Fables and Genealogies, right? Right? And they were believing they could get it done by who I am. They thought they could get it done by some, some uh, wishy-washy story out here, the fable, that taught a lesson, but it did not put them in good stead with God. Whereas Jesus Christ is the one mediator. And I think that's uh, uh, something that we need to be very much aware of. A go-between and the man Jesus Christ is the one who gave himself as a ransom for us. 
There's another definition. What is a ransom? Anyone? That's a question. What is a ransom? Anybody? I remember reading, I wasn't living, when the Lindbergh baby, I've heard that history story, there was a ransom to get him back after he was kidnapped. I've heard of other ransoms. All of us have seen the crime story where there has been, has the ransom note came in? Uh, have we gotten that yet from whatever terrible happened? But what is a ransom? Very good. So we're either paying for a person or property to be brought back, correct? So if Jesus Christ is our ransom, we shouldn't have any trouble understanding that because of being kidnapped by sin and being enslaved to sin, Christ sends his son as a ransom to pay back because we couldn't get it done. We couldn't get it done as a ransom to pay back, as Shelley has said, you know, a payment for that to get the release of the property or the person in return for the payment. So just want you to think about this. Jesus didn't die to ransom us from Satan. He died to ransom us from being enslaved in sin. That's what the ransom was for. That's what he died for, to take us from the way we were living to there. Now, I know Satan had something to do with it, but Satan wasn't asking for a payment for every person. Satan would just as soon not even have sent a ransom note because God certainly would be capable of paying the ransom. But instead, he takes his sinless son, and that's what it's just told us, that he was the ransom for that. Ransom, he was released he did that for us. Interesting to me that Paul has to say in verse 7, if you will look there, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Uh, been around any, anybody been around high school lately? Anybody been around teenage kids lately? Because that's, that's, that's a standard term. I'm not lying. Uh, my car broke down. I'm not, I'm not lying. Kevin's laughing because he used to teach just like I did. But isn't that, I mean, if, you, if you've been around, and I'm not picking on teenagers. I'm just saying it's a term. Hey, I'm not I'm not lying. But we're talking about a whole different deal here. We're talking about the Word of God and Paul's just making sure that they understand that this is the truth, the Word of God. He became the preacher and I'm appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Um. Thinking on the ransom that had to go out for the life that we covered in chapter 1 of 1 Timothy as Paul outlined his horrendous character. We see how wonderful the blood of Christ is. How wonderful our only God is and how wonderful our mediator is that puts us in a relationship with God. But he goes on to say that I am a preacher and an apostle. Anybody remember the highlights of that? Yes, sir. Right. Exactly. 
false teachers would say Jesus is lying to you, right. he's not an apostle, and, and I think his whole life is struggled with it, trying to get a lot of people out of the I agree. I agree with you. And you notice he leaves Timothy behind in Ephesus, and he goes, no, I'm kidding. But, you, but you're right. You're exactly right. Can you imagine with that kind of, I'm just going to use the term baggage, that he carried around, not, not, I mean, because they knew of his background. But isn't it a great thing to know that uh, the ransom was paid for even somebody like him? Boy, that put those people in Ephesus in a pretty good spot, as he told us in First Corinthians, I mean, the first chapter of First Timothy. Puts them in a pretty good spot. But you're exactly right. Thank you, Richard. Uh, great, great point. Uh, anyone else on uh, anything there? Tell me about, or excuse me, I'm not, uh, share with me about what that must have been like coming from there. Because remember, he is on the road going somewhere. And he is taken and told to go somewhere and he obeys the gospel. The ransom's paid for him. And now he becomes the apostle, the same thing that Richard said. And so he's got a lot of authority. He's got an awful lot of authority and he begins to do that. But uh, he makes sure that they know that he is a teacher and remember, he was assigned to go to the Gentiles. I do know that he was assigned to go. That was what he was to do. Teach the truth and have a great amount of faith. So he goes on and says, and notice what it begins to tell us. It says, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner, we will talk about the women, but anyone want to reflect anything on the lifting of holy hands before I share with you what I had prepared about that. Anyone, the lifting of holy hands. I know that many places you go, you might see some people do this. I will tell you that I've seen many a man and lady get off their seat, that means from here, and get themselves kneel down on the floor to pray. I have seen people get prostrate completely down on the floor. I have seen people just stand still with their head bowed and prayed. And I just want you to know that what he's referring to here, to here is a bunch of Old Testament things that we could look at that many times they were showing their hands were, as he says there, let me make sure I read it correctly so that you will know that, Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubtings. In other words, exposing God, I am praying to you with clean hands. I don't have sin in my life. I'm not arguing. I am not disputing. I am lifting holy hands to you, just like the one that gets on their knee and pray or the one that gets on the floor in the front and prays. Not done for show. It is done, and that's what the lifting of the holy hands. I had a whole, uh, whole large list of uh, different things having to do with holy hands, and it had to do with. Uh, and I'll just, I just want to share this with you. Uh, the answer about lifting hands in prayers is it's not the only reference to prayer in the Bible. Listen to these. Prayer was made standing, it was made sitting, it was made kneeling, it was made bowing down, it was lying down, it was prostrate, it was with hands spread upwards, it was lifting hands, it was beating the breast, it was looking unto heaven, it was having downcast eyes, it was wearing sackcloth and ashes while fasting. So to say that if somebody ever challenged and said, well, I came in and when y'all prayed, nobody lifted hell, hell, uh, holy hands. Well, guess what? Uh, no, I'd rather beat my chest. I'd rather wear sackcloth. I'd rather lay down. I'd rather stand up. I'd rather bow my head. It's the same thing. All he's saying is when we approach God, there is no special way other than having a clean heart. 
And that's kind of what it indicates that we need to be about. That's what he's trying to tell them because you can just imagine people that were being exposed to prayer and were getting ready to jump right into it with the ladies that we're getting ready to talk about. It wasn't about showing. It was about the reverence of your heart and your mind to God and no special no special position that we take when we uh, petition God with any of those things. And it does not, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a literal thing of lifting holy hands. Now, any challenge to that? Anyone? Anybody? I know that uh, I've had some, some uh, people comment to one or two of my daughters that uh, I did notice that nobody lifts holy hands and when y'all pray. And um, the question was... I, I thought it was just a, a common posture at that time. Exactly. I mean, if I, I've seen people do it now, and I, don't, I just figure it's... What they do. What yeah. 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 Exactly. Yes, exactly. Amen. I don't find anything wrong with it. And, uh, you know, and if we decided to all do it one day, that would be fine. If we all decide to get on one knee, that'd be fine. But to say it has to be that way is wrong. It's really, listen, you and I both know we're mature enough to know it comes from our heart and our mind. And that's really what is being said here uh, or what I was reading, I think he's saying. So let's take a look and uh, we'll probably get to the end of the lesson with this. I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And now he jumps real quick. Now remember, we're talking about at church. Now we're getting ready to jump over to the ladies. That the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. So how would that tell me moderate clothing in your mind? Because remember, we're talking about a different day and time. I don't know if how much aware you are of, of that day and time, but uh, it was uh, something that now, with a little bit of research, not a whole lot, but a little bit of research, I found that there was oftentimes a brothel right outside the temple at many of these large cities. And coming from one of those places, of course, the allurement of the kind of lady, I'm just going to use lady that would work in that place, would be to adorn herself and have uh, wonderful looking hair and look very nice and very dressed, uh, very whatever. But notice what God says, or the Word of God says. God, Word of God says women adore themselves in godliness by being being modest in their apparel, you know, a woman that, and it goes on to say, with modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with a bunch of, and it is nowhere in here saying that that cannot, those things cannot be worn. Nowhere. It's not saying you cannot do that. It is just saying if it's about a show, if, it, if you're trying to be Miss America at church, you might have the wrong kind of attitude before you walk in the door. And that's what he has just and listen, it was a challenge in that day and time. I can just imagine with all that going around in those big cities as they're coming into worship. Yes, ma'am, go right ahead. You know, I think right from the beginning, Adam and Eve were seen with their wickedness. Yep. That kind of set off right then. If they were ashamed of right. their skin, that may, should be something maybe we should right. be ashamed of yep. showing skin. Yep. Yes, it does very much. But uh, go right ahead. Um, I think you brought up a good point. The emphasis and the, the culture there and the uh, idol worship. And right. The temple prostitutes. And right. I mean, that were, yep. I mean, it was, I, most people, they, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to talk to you. Women dress the part that you can pretty much play that. 
Right. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, going going forward, unless somebody has something else. And there, hey, listen, there's no, I don't think there's an eldership. I don't think there's a mother and dad. Uh, I mean, there's some dads that won't let children out of the house wearing certain clothes. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's no way to absolutely, you know, again, just say this is the way it's going to be. And it's got to be, you know, then you get into a, it's got to be six inches below your knee, your skirts, and it can't be. You've got to quit shopping in the little kid's T-shirt cup. You know, you've got to wear something appropriate and be modest, you know. And, uh, but uh, I think that all of us would agree with that. So let's look at the second part of that. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Um, I want you to know in Roman culture where they lived and uh, going back, uh, women were considered to be intellectually second class. And that's, that, so you understand, this isn't Wayne talking. This is the way the culture was. That's the way it was. It was widely accepted that females were academically inferior. That's the way the Romans treated ladies back then, or women back then. Matter of fact, to be very honest with you, uh, we didn't, ladies weren't allowed to vote in this country because people thought all kinds of different things. I don't know all of it, but I can, I can assure you from God's word, we didn't have to wait till the 19th Amendment for ladies to be able to vote. But at the same time, if we think about where we've gotten to today, like they've got some kind of special rights because they are female. No, they are created by God, just like men were, and they are on an equal plane with that relationship. And he goes on to say that in verse, uh, excuse me, Paul says in verse 11, let a woman learn quietly with all being in submission. Now, what does that mean? They are to learn quietly. They weren't about to let them go sit in with the men that were being taught in that day and time, but a woman was to learn quietly in submission. In other words, she wasn't out there vocalizing the same thing the men were, but she was learning in submission about those things. Uh, Paul says that she is to learn so it's not a question of God saying, okay, men go learn, men pray, women don't learn. No, that's not at all what he said. They are to learn in submission. They are to learn. The Roman world said that the woman was not quite up to it. It is important to remember that is a spiritual submission, is a spiritual quality that is commanded of all Christians men and women. Word of God tells us a couple of different times in the New Testament that we are to submit ourselves. We are to be submissive, whether we are man or a woman. Uh, we need to make sure that we have that understood. Now, I know that there would be some reasoning behind everything, but I want to stick with the Word of God and just tell you, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and listen, you and I had nothing to do with this. You and I had absolutely nothing to do with this. But listen to what it says. And Adam was not deceived. Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So Adam, here's what happened. The roles were lined up and they switched places. The woman moved ahead of Adam and, told, and fell for it and then deceived her husband, whereas she took the place of the man in the Garden of Eden. She was the one deceived, and if she had not been deceived, I guess they would not have been deceived, but that's all in the past. But it's important to remember that it is a spiritual quality. We must be submissive to God and to one another, uh, you know, as we struggle in our Christian faith. 
and it goes on. I had a couple of other things, but uh, we're running out of time, or I should say women. I mean, I am running out of time. But they do have different responsibilities. Anybody want to add anything to the thing of being in submission? I know that a lot, a lot of, a lot of places, a lot of ladies, uh, women that become Christians, do not speak out in class because of uh, or anywhere in the worship setting because of that very passage. But uh, God is telling women to learn in submission. In other words, you have to learn. And then you have a huge responsibility, as he goes on to say a little bit later, with that opportunity of childbirth. Anybody, anything you want to add to the thing of submission? Anyone? I've always been challenged by a woman, a lady that is a Christian being able to teach a Bible lab. What's that? No, I know, I know, but there would be some to challenge the fact that he was baptized. And I'd say, yes, but he understood what he needed to do to have his soul saved, but he's 12 years old. There's an awful lot a lady can do in teaching without being a subjective or trying to uh, be, put them down to that point. So, any questions? Notice that, uh, please, one thing before we leave. Sorry, we're going a little over. Prayer. Men are to pray. Men are to pray. Women Generally, in the worship service, as we said, that's what it was. And then the thing of submission, and we can pick it up later. Sorry that, ladies, sorry that y'all were treated so bad in this country for so long. All they had to do, the forefathers had to read the Word of God, and they know that you needed to be top shelf right there with us. So, thank you very much. Uh, let's bow in prayer before we leave, if you don't mind, because I told you we would get to it at the end. I wanted to try to... Get that done. Our God and Father, as we bow and give you thanks for the day and the blessings, the time we've spent studying tonight, we're so thankful for the opportunity to be here, to share with one another, to study your word. Thank you for the good results Kevin has been having. We're praying for his continued good health. Pray for Brother Harold as he is going through some treatment now at Advent and Rains Jackson and his issues uh, that he is facing, but also pray for the Norton family as uh, Linda is under some tough trials. Also, we're kind of uh, really devastated by the news about uh, Carl having to have a relapse in his situation and uh, just praying for good things. What a wonderful attitude he has about things, but we need to be praying for him and also pray for Christine and the loss of her brother. All this we pray in Christ's name, and in his name we give you thanks for the grace and mercy that have been extended, uh, extended to us through our obedience to him. Amen. Thank you all.